Thank you, Mr. Lopez, and good evening, everyone. You guys excited? Yeah. All right. So um, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, we always like hearing uh, what the public is interested in. Um, soliciting information and input from the public is very important for us, so we, we're happy to be able to provide this platform for you all to speak tonight. Um, we are continuing our budget hearing from earlier today. Um, this is the public testimony. Um, your testimony should be about the budget. All right. We ask you to please comply with those rules because sometimes people want to come in and talk about the fact that the 76ers won last night. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> no conversations about sports or any unrelated issues. It would be very helpful. Um, I'm assuming everybody that's speaking signed up. Um, we're going to call you up in the order in which you signed up or either you send in your email request to speak. Um, we have a significant number of people to testify tonight, so we are going to uh, um, authorize two minutes per person. Some of you all may have written testimony that's beyond the two minutes. We're going to ask you to please summarize that because what we want to do is to make sure we give everybody an opportunity to speak tonight. Okay? Okay? So, um, we have a timer, a little egg beater. It's going to ring, let you know your two minutes are up. So, we ask you if you're still talking, please kind of like uh, summarize it and conclude your remarks. And thank you very much for your anticipated uh, adherence to our guidelines. Mr. Stitt, if you can call the first names, we're going to call up three. Rashida Phillips, Sheila Harper, Alan Buckovitz. Yeah. Al Alyssa Schatz. And one last thing, um, we can ask if you have a, a cell phone or any other electronic device that makes noise, we ask that you please turn it off or turn it on uh, silent. Um, or if you want to talk on it, please go outside. Thank you very much. Good evening. And Good evening. welcome. Please state your name. Alan uh, Butkovitz. Rashida Phillips. All right, well, it's for your testimony. Go ahead. State your name. You guys can self-select. Okay. The... I'll go first. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rashida Phillips. I'm the managing attorney of the housing unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. With the support of City Council, the Mayor, and the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Philadelphia Eviction Prevention Project, also known as PEP, was launched in January of 2018 with funding of $500,000. PEP is a collaboration of seven outstanding nonprofits, Community Legal Services, Philly VIP, Legal Clinic for the Disabled, Senior Law Center, TURN, Clarify, and Regional Housing Legal Services. PEP is utilizing best practices and innovative strategies, high quality legal representation, community outreach, technology and collaboration to reduce evictions, prevent homelessness, improve housing conditions, and stabilize communities in Philadelphia. Eviction and the threat of eviction is a crisis in Philadelphia, impacting one in 14 renters and connecting to a growing crisis of mass eviction and displacement in many neighborhoods throughout our city. More than 22,000 evictions were filed in municipal court in 2016, with 81% of landlords receiving legal representation and only 8% of tenants receiving legal representation. That number does not include the significant number of illegal evictions that are never filed with the court. The Philadelphians most impacted by these evictions, both legal and illegal, are single mothers, their children, seniors, African-American families, immigrant communities, and people living with disabilities. I'm going to skip around. That could not have been two minutes already. <laughs> um, this is why PEP is so important. Because 
Because of this program and the commitment of our leaders and housing advocates, many more tenants will be able to benefit from expert legal representation, ensuring access to justice, improve substandard housing conditions, and preventing homelessness and its devastating effects. Just quickly, some of, our, um, some of the success that we've seen in the few months that it's launched. In just three months, the Landlord-Tenant Help Center has provided substantive legal advice, referrals, and full representation to 220 people um, facing eviction. The Lawyer of the Day program has helped 67 tenants on the day of their court hearings. The Court Navigator has served 232 people. Our tenant assistance phone line has assisted 355 callers. We've sent out over 400 mailings to tenants with pending hearings, providing additional notice of their hearing dates in an attempt to reduce the number of default judgments. Traffic to our website, phillytenant.org, has more than doubled since November. Um, and we've also created... Summarize it. Okay. Here you go. So yeah. in summary, legal aid is an effective tool to fight evictions and reduce homelessness in Philadelphia, and it is cost effective. We hope to see ex um, funding for the PEP project expanded to $850,000 this year and to continue to see this program sustained. Thank you again for the Thank opportunity you. to testify. Thank you. Um, what, what, what you can do, because I understand that some of you may have some lengthy testimony, just submit it to us and we'll have it in the, as a matter of record. All yes. right? Thank you. You're welcome. Next. You want me? Okay. I'm, I'm Alan Butkovitz. I'd like to uh, talk as fast as I can and hit three major points. Number one, the outrageous and obscene recent uh, tax reassessment combined with the proposed real estate tax uh, rate increase. We need a circuit breaker. Uh, in Philadelphia, consideration has been given to people who live in new construction to have 10-year abatements. Consideration has been given for economic development projects. And yet the people who live near new construction get hit with the burden of massive increases in taxes. We have one group back here that had a 70% increase in one year. It shouldn't be possible to have a 70% increase in one year. 7%, twice the rate of inflation, is more like it. And I just want to note that the state constitution authorizes legislation that would, in fact, allow the legislature, in combination with the council, to grant abatements to anybody in a gentrifying neighborhood. So we could reverse this, this uh, process of unfairly moving people out of the city to make, pl uh, make pl place for the new Philadelphians, people from New York, and the people who can afford to turn this into a little Manhattan. Secondly, with respect... <laughs> With respect to the scrutiny of school financial practices, I was actually sickened yesterday to see the comments by Superintendent Height about if Philly just pulls together, we can fix these sick buildings. When I was the city controller, we, in conjunction with the teachers union, for 10 years pointed out uh, the dangerous conditions of school buildings. At the time, we knew it would be a $7 billion rebuild. We helped, we helped the school district by paring that down to $50 million in emergency repairs and $1 million in the super emergency repairs, and were met with the answer that they couldn't find a $1 million out of their $4.5 billion budget to take care of the most dangerous conditions in schools. And now that we're reading front page articles about kids eating paint chips and losing their ability to do math in their head, now the school district says that this is an emergency. But, but it, it it reinforces that council, now that they've taken the responsibility for the schools, has to do a deep dive. The city controller should have the power to do uh, management and, and uh, management audits of the school district, just as they do with the city government. And you can't just take for granted that when the school district says, we ran out of $3 billion, please refill the basket, that you're going to do it. Finally. The question of tax policy generally. About 20 years ago, the tax reform movement in Philadelphia was aimed at getting rid of nuisance business taxes. Now you can't tell, hide from, you know, you can't tell top from bottom because you're trying to get rid of the gross receipts tax, trying to get rid of the net income tax, then you impose a soda tax or God knows what next, a pizza tax or a pretzel tax, which it was exactly the inspiration for the tax reform movement in council that, that the cost of running the schools, cost of running the city was to be equally born as the cost of being a part of a civilized society and not to be imposed in a way that you're going to put particular businesses and particular people out of business. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Alyssa Schatz, and I'm here today as a property owner and a parent testifying in support of the proposed property tax increases, although not 70%. Just throwing that out there. Um, the School Reform Commission has officially dissolved, and the city of Philadelphia has taken responsibility back for the education of our children. However, our property taxes, a primary source of education funding, are significantly lower than any other county in southeastern Pennsylvania or in neighboring counties in New Jersey. If you live in Delaware County, a $250,000 home would be taxed at $4,175 a year. In Cherry Hill, it would be nearly $8,000. And in Philadelphia, it would be just one third of that um, at $2,275 a year. Um, the proposed increase of just 4% would cost the owner of a $250,000 home less than $95 a year and less than $8 a month. That, to me, is more than a fair price to pay for the improvements that the school district plans to implement with these funds. These worthwhile investments include hiring additional teachers to eliminate split classrooms, additional ESL teachers, additional music teachers, adding new programs for special education students, and supporting early literacy in elementary schools. These are the things that we can give to our children if we choose to invest in them. Unfortunately, we are currently investing significantly less in education per student than any of the surrounding counties that I mentioned. We see the fallout from this chronic underinvestment in our children, not only in test scores, educational and vocational outcomes, but in basic health and safety, as Mr. Butkovitz mentioned earlier. We are failing at our most basic duty as citizens to keep our children safe and give them the tools they need to succeed in life. I and many of my peers believe we should be investing in our children, and I'm ready and willing to make the needed investment via an increase in property taxes. We must protect our low-income residents by further increasing the homestead exemption or any other programs that would create a hardship exemption for our neighbors with low income. That said, a property tax is still one of the most progressive tax proposals at your disposal and is far less regressive than the wage tax, sales tax, and vice taxes. If our schools are not improved and made safe for our children, many people with young children, the same people who have contributed greatly to Philadelphia's tax base and growth over the past decade, will leave the city for counties that do invest in their children. I urge you to demonstrate your support for our children by supporting a modest property tax increase with protections for low-income residents. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sophie Bryan, Diane Wolf Gray, Fran Hazam. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. My, my name is uh, Francis Scullion Hazen. Uh, I'm a resident of the 2101 Cooperative. Um, after 40 years of living in Tarsdale, I migrated to my with my husband Dennis to the community of 2101 Cooperative in Center City. Our move enabled Dennis and I to continue to work together for the next six years, only 10 blocks from our office in the dialysis center at Will's Eye that sustained him. In downsizing from a house to one bedroom apartment, we were able uh, to be contributing members of our community, assisting persons recovering from mental health challenges. We have been supported by a building that looks like the other high rises of million dollar condos in the neighborhood, but which is a haven for others like us who seek affordable housing close to support systems that enable independence. Dennis needed a walker to get around, so having a food store and laundry and bus within view provided comfort, only because the 2101 cooperative's costs fit our modest budget. Most of the residents we encountered were adults working or retired from teaching, social services, or civil service, the very employees who keep our communities going. Dennis believed in cooperative living space since his early career in city planning. He had former coworker friends living blocks away in one of the other cooperatives. We worked with many persons with disabilities who were homeless. Dennis helped those folks recover by making sure they got through the bureaucracy maze to get their benefits. He could not have imagined that some of our own neighbors who moved into our cooperative 10, 20 years ago might be forced to leave and face homelessness. Dennis left us last year, as we all hope to leave our home at 2101 
in a plain coffin. So I'm here to tell his story. Dennis won't be here to help our neighbors. You city council members can help them by amending the senior freeze on taxes to include the few limited equity cooperatives, older residents who meet the requirements to participate in the freeze. Keep the original mission of affordable housing for low income persons alive in Philadelphia. Let our eldest neighbors leave us in peace as Dennis left us. One of the last outings Dennis had was to the voting booth across the street for the November election. Like most of our neighbors, we never missed an election and participated in the Vote for Homes Coalition to secure persons with disabilities were able to vote. We 2101 residents will be at the voting booth next Tuesday. Thank you for your testimony. Please proceed. My name is Diane Wolf Gray. I am 85 years old and I'm a 22 year resident and shareholder at the 2101 Cooperative at 21st and Walnut Streets, which has been recognized as affordable housing for 60 years. Because there were two years with no increase in Social Security, along with increases in the Medicare payment every year, I have had the same net amount of Social Security to live on for the past four years, which is $1,136 a month. My IRA, which I carefully plan to outlive me, is almost gone. I have been forced to withdraw more than ever anticipated. I take advantage of PACE and the Pennsylvania Lottery real estate tax rebate. Uh, I don't qualify for anything else. I live on lots of cans of salt-free tuna. HUD housing has thousands of elderly on their four and five year waiting lists. This is not a solution for someone my age and in my present situation anyway, I can't afford to move. Recently, the real estate taxes on our co-op were raised 70%. It is under appeal. I am at the cutting edge of possibility the possibility of not having the home that I plan to live on for the rest of my life. What is the future for me? The decision to retire to a co-op was sanctioned by an accountant and an attorney when I was planning retirement. It was considered a wise decision. I was a working single parent of two children and learned the hard way to, to save most of my pennies. But the present day, I have cut my budget to the bone and have no further ways to decrease it. And at 85, with medical conditions, I have no way to increase my income. But you, you people sitting here who represent the elderly like me living in co-ops, you have the ability to alleviate some of my fears of homelessness. Seniors living in co-ops are the only seniors excluded from the low-income senior tax freeze. That makes me unequal to other seniors and susceptible to the real estate tax increases beyond my means. You can change that law so that we all are included. It would affect hundreds of voters living in co-ops and it would cost the city very little in lost revenue. Please, Thank you. please open your hearts to make this change. Please consider taking these small steps to help alleviate the, some of the fears that keep me up at night. Allow seniors in co-ops right. the, the low income senior tax freeze. Right. Help we, us to be equal with the law, with, with other got, senior citizens. Right now, we are we right now. Thank you. Please give us this consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you didn't put a name on that. Anonymous, sorry. All right. okay. all right. I'm glad you didn't put our names on there. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, so. Good afternoon, Council President Clark and members of City Council. My name is Sophie Bryan, and I serve as the Executive Director of Philadelphia VIP. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the City's proposed budget. 
Oh, sure. I'm moving up the mic here. Uh, my testimony today is in support of council amending the proposed budget to add funding for the Philadelphia Eviction Prevention Project. Since its founding in 1981, Philadelphia VIP has been proud to serve as the pro bono hub of Philadelphia. We recruit, train, and support volunteer attorneys who represent low-income clients, businesses, and nonprofits for free. Uh, the essential driver behind why VIP exists and why it still matters is that a person's ability to achieve a fair and just outcome depends on having a lawyer, and every year tens of thousands of Philadelphians confront daunting legal cases without lawyers. Uh, specifically with respect to eviction, in the 24,000 eviction cases filed in 2016, only 9% of tenants had lawyers and 81% of landlords had lawyers. Mm -hmm. Mirroring its response to the mortgage foreclosure crisis more than 10 years ago, City Council has directed its leadership and energy on the eviction crisis. It was thanks to Council's fact-finding hearing last year and budget advocacy that the Philadelphia Eviction Prevention Project was launched. I don't want to mirror my colleague Rashida Phillips' testimony, um, so I thought I would tell, share a brief client story that I think highlights why the project matters. Uh, this is a, here's my little client story here. Um, Ms. V, who it's not her full name, a Spanish-speaking client from Puerto Rico, moved into her apartment in August 2017. At the start of her tenancy, the property wasn't habitable. A pipe underneath the sink was leaking, leaking, roaches infested the kitchen, and the basement had standing water. The landlord promised to repair the property, but failed to make repairs. The leaking pipe began to rot, the standing water in the basement was in fact sewage, and roaches infested the entire property. Ms. V asked her landlord time and again to fix her home and he refused to do so. After months of pleading with him to make repairs, she stopped paying her rent and began to escrow it. The landlord retaliated by filing eviction case against her. Ms. V went to court on her own and negotiated an agreement to repay the rent if the landlord made repairs. He didn't do so. The landlord also failed to come back to court and Ms. V won an initial victory. The landlord turned around and tried to evict her again. This time, she reached out to legal services and was paired with a volunteer attorney from VIP and a Penn Law student who acted as, as an interpreter. The team of Ms. V, her attorney, and her student was victorious. Almost finished. The story has a good ending. The volunteer got the case discontinued. The landlord agreed to repay $2,400 to the client um, and return her security deposit. Additionally, L&I came out to the property and condemned it, so no future tenants will have to suffer Thank that you. fate. This is Thank thanks you. to Council's advocacy, and we're asking to please restore this funding. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa Simone. Thank all of you. Alice McKenzie, Janet Pollitt, Frank Ortiz, Frank Ortiz. Okay. Jessica Way. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Alice McKenzie. I'm also a resident at 2101 Co-op. Unlike my other shareholders, I'm a newbie in the building. I moved in one year ago. I moved in because, one, it put me back into the city. And being a New York City kid from the Bronx, the burbs weren't for me. But I came back because it was where I wanted to be. It was affordable for my husband and I to continue our lifestyle, doing the things we enjoyed doing. While, when I moved in, my carrying charges were about $638.
My carrying charges are well over $700 now, and that was within a year. I feel that as a senior, we should be entitled to the senior tax freeze. We are a, we are affordable housing. 75% of the building are seniors. And we all enjoy the amenity, the few amenities we get by being in the neighborhood. Center City is a, a buzz with things, but why should the, the seniors be paying for people who can afford a $2 million home? Thank you. Okay. My name is Janet Pollitt, and I also live at 2101 Cooperative. I moved into 2101 Cooperative 19 years ago with my mother. We thought we had died and gone to heaven. We loved our apartment. We loved the co-op uh, mentality, and the location was absolutely perfect. Sadly, I lost my mother in 2010, and I continued to live in my apartment and enjoy the city. I always thought that they would carry me out of my apartment in a pine box. And we brought that today to show you. And but was now I find myself faced with the very real prospect of losing my home. Mind you, after 19 years, it's not a matter of a couple of suitcases. Last year, Due to the reassessment of our real estate taxes, we were all faced with a 13% increase. That, paired with our yearly increase, gave me a totally unreasonable increase for the year of over $120. So my apartment is now becoming very shortly unavailable to me. <laughs> so I started looking for other housing options. I found that anything that might be affordable had a waiting list of four to five years. They wouldn't even put my name on the list. Now, at the ripe old age of 80, I may find myself homeless. No longer can I afford my subscription to the orchestra, go to the theater, or have that occasional dinner out. Philadelphia will be losing a productive citizen, my dollars, and my vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica Way. I'm a medical assisting teacher in the Philadelphia School District, a member of the Caucus of Working Educators. <laughs> And a, and a proud part of the Our City, Our Schools Coalition. And we're here today because we think it's time for the wealthy in our city to pay for our public schools. We're simply asking that the corporations, developers, and universities of this city pay their fair share by ending the 10-year tax abatement, making the universities contribute taxes, and ensuring that corporations are paying the big business tax. I have been fortunate to be a mentor to some of the greatest children in the world. One of my students won a $100,000 grant to bring health care to the homeless. And recently, another one of my students successfully resuscitated a woman in Philadelphia who had overdosed on opioids. My students have performed thousands of hours of community service in Philadelphia and in healthcare facilities all around this city. My students are bright, precocious, and creative. And if you met them, you would love them, like everybody else who visits my classroom does. And that's why I can't stand the conditions that they're learning in right now. Water fountains that can't be used due to lead contamination, toilets covered up by garbage bags, flaking lead paint coming from the ceiling onto our desks, 10-year-old textbooks, 33 kids in a crowded classroom, old milk and bread in the cafeteria, no athletic facilities, nurses that come two days a week, 
My students are not less than anybody else's students, and my students don't deserve anything less than anybody else's students. We have allies in West Virginia, Oklahoma, Colorado, Puerto Rico, and Honor, Arizona that share our same feelings. And we've watched as our government starved our schools and then turned around and said to us, you know, your schools are kind of deficient. And I've also watched as my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, refused to pay a dime for payment in lieu of taxes. And then, and then turned around and asked the teachers in this city, can you host our students from our education school? Can you host our nurses with your school nurses? We're done. No more freebies. No more handouts. It's time for big business in Philly to pay up. And it's time for us to force them to do it. Fund our schools. 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 Sit down. Calm down. You guys up there, just calm down. All right, we heard you. We got it. Hey, hey, look, hold, 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 hold. Time out, time out, time out, time out. Time out. We got a lot of people that want to testify. Quiet, please. All right, man. We got a lot of people that want to testify, so we're taking away from those times of those individuals. All right. Ma'am, you got to, okay. <laughs> All right, next three. Joseph Ray, Katrina Clark, Herman Douglas. All right, hold on. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Hi. Please proceed. Hi, my name is Katrina Clark. I've been teaching for 13 years. Three years ago, I actually joined the district and earned the Lindbeck Teacher of the Year Award. But I became a teacher because I wanted to make sure that every child in Philadelphia had access to a quality education. Unfortunately, despite my and my colleagues' efforts across the district, it is nearly impossible to provide a quality education to our students. You've heard teachers across the nation with the same message, but it's easy to think that ours is different. It is not. Our story is not better. We are the same. It's easy to think that kindergartners who do not get recess at an elementary school is a story from somewhere else. But in reality, there is a lack of staff at Harrington Elementary School, just down the street in West Philadelphia. The youngest students who need recess the most are sitting out for seven hours a day. Imagine knowingly sending your child to sit in a room with active leaks, mold, rodents, asbestos from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., five days a week. Would you send your child there? 
I'm not talking about a school in Detroit. I'm not talking about a school in Denver. I'm talking about a school in West Philadelphia. I'm talking about my school. It's easy to think that students learning in 80 or 90 degree classrooms happen somewhere else, maybe Arizona. No, I'm talking about my school. We are actively sending children in the workshop school and many other district schools with these same issues every single day. Every day we force students to go to school and we force them to be exposed to asbestos along with algebra. So please tell me, what color should my student's skin be in order to deserve a school free from leaks and mold? How much money should my students' families make before they have a right to not breathe in air filled with roach feces? Tell me, what company should I become the CEO of so that I might not be considered complicit in this crime committed every day? Okay. The only way to act is to fund our schools ethically, equitably, and fully. Fund our Thank you. schools. Thank you. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Folks, folks, a lot of you all have never been here to testify, all right? So we have a lot of people who want to testify, and I understand that you are passionate. Listen to me, because we're going to have order in here, all right? So if you want to testify, we're going to give you an opportunity to testify. But the longer you get into these chants of funding our schools, you're going to delay people being able to come testify. All right, so can you please let people testify? I understand right after, Chair, okay. We can't have these long, prolonged chants because you're taking time away from everybody else, please. Thank you for your cooperation. Ma'am. It's my turn? Yes, ma'am. My name is you've been here. You've been here since this morning. My name is Sandra Reeder, R-E-E-D-E-R. -E -E I live at the Pavilion Apartments, Penn LLC. They use variants for their names. They're operating illegal, okay? I've been involved with detect crooked detectives since I was 53 years old. I came here today because of Mayor Kenny wants to pass that tax for schools. You don't need to do that. You need to stop operating illegally in Philadelphia. Where I live, they've gotten almost $100 million, and they put down the primary reason is to renovate the building I live in, where they haven't done anything. Okay, they did put a toilet in my apartment. Anyhow, paid Philadelphia Authority for PA, Philadelphia Authority for Industrial Development, Board of, the direct, Board of Directors is giving them millions and millions of dollars in a few years. They have gotten almost a hundred million dollars and they don't have a license, no business license, okay? On Kashahawken Avenue, L and I, you, that map, you know, if, if um, the business has a license, that little house shows up on that map. Since I've been doing my investigation, to the mic, since I've been doing my investigation, the map won't come up. It would be sparse because all those buildings don't have li um, a license. Okay, this is just one place I'm talking about. That um um that I brought some of the uh, minutes with me from paid. Um, um, that's getting like up to 33, 30, 33 million dollars in bonds. Supposed to be for the renovation of the apartment building. Um, one kitchen, I forget the first initials to, to this company called Kitchen. They put down that, um, they did all this renovation in the pavilion. They got the contract for the Wynn Senior Apartment. Okay, all these places are getting all this money. All these businesses do not have licenses in Philadelphia. They're not paying their taxes, okay? So you need to go after them, and you can't tell me you don't know they exist, all right? There's an element, a faction of these crooked detectives. You all 
won't touch. The police won't touch. Okay, I contacted the police. I've been 302 so many times, I've lost track. Okay, the first time they had me 302, I went back to the 14th Police Department to put in another complaint about them. All right, approximately the year 2002. He knows about it because I went to him last year for help, okay, and got set up. Um. Anyhow, that's Curtis I'm talking about, okay? Anyhow, um, I got 302 when I went back to put in another complaint. They took me to Aunt the Paddy Wagon came. Three policemen picked me up and put me in there. Took me to Einstein Hospital. Not to their psychiatric department, okay, but to the crooked detectives floor on the seventh floor that they rent from Einstein, where they had me and other people gang raped. Right. I passed semen from my rectum. Okay, okay. I so have a medical can, condition now. Okay. okay, wait a minute. Okay, right, I have a medical condition now. You can okay. kind of wrap it up. But yeah. anyhow, about the taxes. No, um, what are you going to do about these buildings operating illegally? HUD is in on it, okay? All right, all right, okay. We got you. Ma'am, I understand. We, 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 we were going to look into the properties. All right, all right, all right. Okay. All right, man. Okay. All right, we got it. All right, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, we got, we got, we got to wrap it up. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, 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 ma'am. No, those are. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right, all right, we got you. All right. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, ma'am. All Come on, we gotta, we gotta move. Thank you, man. Please proceed. Okay. State your name for the record. Hello, my name is Herman Douglas. I am a teacher in Philadelphia. I am also a member of the Caucus of the Working Educators, and I love teaching. God bless the lady that was sitting here today, but that's a reflection of a lot of our classrooms. We see that daily 
and we don't have the funding to actually deal with those type of situations within our classroom. And that's a one reason why we need funding approved within our schools. Now, another thing is this. I'm a father and an entrepreneur. I've been able to purchase properties down the graduate hospital area before. And my wife and I, we did benefit from the abatement, but we didn't understand um, that we were actually taking funding away from our children. And I feel terrible about that. When you look at the complexity of it all, you start to realize that it's, it's extremely big. And I realize that city council may have not realized what the downfall of this abatement actually caused. So what we're asking is for city council to get rid of the 10-year abatement so we can fund... So we can fund our schools to be able to deal with the challenges that you saw here today. It's a couple of things that we need to actually have done. Number one, in a 10-year abatement, which could produce $386 million in surplus. Number two, we could collect taxes from the mega nonprofit like University of Pennsylvania, <laughs> LaSalle, Drexel. That could produce about $95 million surplus. Moreover, we can move to stop the proposed repeal of the big business tax repeal, and that would produce $54 million. Next, number four, increase taxes on the corporate landlords, use the an occupancy tax, that would be $35 million added to us. Number five, we need to have a full audit of the school district of Philadelphia, it's budget. And lastly, number six, we should have a feasibility study for creating a public bank for Philadelphia. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please proceed, sir. Council President Clark and members of council, my name is Joe Ray. I am the 2018 president of the Greater Philadelphia Association of Realtors, better known as GPAR. I've submitted my full uh, written testimony and will now give a, a summary. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of uh, 2,500 members regarding Bill Number 180165, which seeks to increase property taxes, and Bill Number 180167, which seeks to increase the rate of realty transfer tax. Uh, the proposed increases to the property tax and real estate transfer tax will have an adverse impact on individuals, families, uh, small business owners, first-time home buyers, and elderly, elderly homeowners who are my primary clients. <clears throat> uh, especially, uh, GPAR opposes the proposed fifth real estate tax increase in, the, in less than 10 years and the second increase to the real estate transfer tax in as many years. <clears throat> We support efforts to ensure good childhood, childhood education and quality city services. We, 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 would like to, we would like the city to implement responsible physical plan that includes cost-saving measures, institutes sound accounting practices, goes after, go after those who evade paying taxes, uh, avoids, avoid creating- Hold on, Mr. Ray, Mr. Ray, hold on. Please, everybody should have the chance to speak. You don't want to be interrupted. Don't interrupt anybody else, please. Mr. Ray, please. Avoid creating more barriers to home ownership and preserve programs that generate long-term revenue. The budget does propose some savings, but for every dollar in city spending reductions, it seeks to increase spending by $12. We need a mindset that doesn't look for tax and spending increase by default. We seek a mindset that is truly committed to strategically identifying government, government inefficiencies and cost-saving measures. Together, we need to advance policies that drive Philadelphia forward as a place to live. We count on our city leaders to implement creative physical plans using tax increases as the last possible course of action and cost saving measures as a first, as a first option. In addition uh, to incorporating more physical restraint and better accounting practices, we strongly advocate for al alternative approaches to collect collecting delinquent taxes. We support the proposed securitization le uh, legislation introduced by Councilman Dom, uh, Bill 
180349 as a city we should never reward tax delinquency too many hard-working Philadelphians diligently pay their property tax to fund city services meanwhile there are some who work hard to evade <laughs> paying taxes uh, if I can ask so you to wrap fear. up please it, your time's up in closing yeah. we promote home ownership people that want to live and work in Philadelphia and consistent and uh, consistent tax hikes sends the wrong message Thank you for your consideration you. and thoughts. Okay, thank you. Today. thank you. All right. All right. Oh, please. Okay, please. Now, our next three, please, Mr. Stitt. Pete McDermott, Allison Storr. Devin Spear. We got three. Okay. All right, whoever would like to go first, please identify yourself and proceed. Excuse me. Hi, my name is Allison Storr, and I'm a member of Two One Five People's Alliance. Because I bought a renovated row home three years ago, I receive a tax abatement. But there is no reason why I should not be paying my fair share in property taxes. I believe that the tax abatement is a moral issue. Here is what the abatement means for my block in Point Breeze. Those of us who moved into renovated and new homes in the last few years are paying the least amount in property taxes. We will also be largely insulated from the effects of any proposed property tax hike. According to the 2019 assessments, I will be paying less in property taxes than my block captain who has lived on our block since 1981. And I will be paying less than my next door neighbors who paid $50,000 less for their home than I did but did not receive a tax abatement. And you know who will likely pay even less than I do? Our new neighbors. You see, my block faces Smith School, which was closed in 2013. It was then sold to one developer who immediately sold it to another developer. He will be building 72 condos in the school, and if that's not enough, he will be building 22 six-story homes in a closed school parking lot. And none of, he expects to receive about $600,000 for each of those homes and none of them will pay property taxes. They will all receive a tax abatement. City Council, why are you not asking us to pay our fair share? Stop making us complicit in this moral crime. Good evening. My name is Devin Spear, and I am the Executive Director of Philadelphia Jobs with Justice. I am here today more than three years after I first testified to you as a sophomore at the University of Pennsylvania. I would like to take a moment to reread that testimony to you. My name is Devin Spear, and I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to give you a few remarks before I have to run off to my Russian lit class. I came to the University of Pennsylvania because I believe in its reputation for civic engagement and I am extremely grateful for the opportunities that being a Penn student has afforded me. However, I'm here now because I believe that the pilot program is a step in the right direction towards making Penn the best partner to the city that it can be. I have seen firsthand the way that Penn has engaged with the city and I believe that some of those ways have contributed greatly to the well-being of Philadelphia. However, I don't think this means that the University of Pennsylvania should be completely exempt from contributing to property taxes just like any other large wealthy institution should be required to. I wanted you to hear this testimony again because in the years since I first spoke, very little has changed. I have seen firsthand the unimaginable wealth that Penn and other mega nonprofits have at their disposal. Despite this, the tax base in this city is still built on the backs of working families and our public schools are still struggling. We've all heard now how kids are getting sick just from going to school and the writing is on the wall here. This is not going to get better until the city demands that the wealthy pay their fair share. As you consider this year's budget, I ask you to think about who is being allowed to build skyscrapers at the expense of our children. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Peter McDermott, 
and I'm a career and technical education teacher at Ben Franklin High School just up North Broad Street. I'm a, pr I'm a proud member of the Working Educators Caucus. I'm not a welding teacher, but I pr plan to bring a little bit of fire here today like my colleague Jessica Way. For 22 years, I was making a living. I was working at a marine engineering firm. That all changed for me in the spring of 2016 when I made a conscientious decision to become a teacher and make a difference. There's an indisputable link between education and the economy. Basic education, and especially career and technical education, is imperative to workforce development. Workforce development is something that this city needs severely. Workforce development is essential to economic development, which is vital to achieving a higher standard of living. A robust economy results in a higher tax base that in turn provides greater resources for schools and educational improvements. It is a circle which we must start here today. Ben Franklin had stated that an investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. I'd say let's start doubling down. Yeah. Thank you. Zoe Buckwalter, Anna Pern, Seth Kulik or Kulik, Hasana Bennett. I want to say hi to everybody and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm not a public speaker myself. Ma just, Ma just state your name for the record. My name is Miss Bennett. I'm here speaking on behalf of my daughter, myself, and all the children lost in DHS and CPS services all around the city of Philadelphia and other cities. DHS is wrongfully attaching children. The judges are attaching children, putting the children in foster care needlessly. And I have made many opportunities to call lawyers. Year after year, my daughter got lost in the system. But since then, I have managed to go to school, you know, better myself, and get a parent class certificate. And I let you know that they wrongfully snatched the children needlessly for no reason. I've heard those for financial incentives. Okay, DHS is wrongfully putting children, and DHS and the family court judges wrongfully putting children in foster care needlessly. And sometimes little girls are getting pregnant needlessly in DHS. I want to advocate for all the children and youth. I'm just advocating right now. I'm not an advocate myself, I'm just a man of for Philadelphia. I don't know if y'all can help get the message to city legislation and law enforcement, I mean law, the lawmakers in Harrisburg and the weapon, all around this country, not just here in Philadelphia alone. But I want to know if you can help me get my grievance out against, not against, against the family court judges and DHS and their affiliates for wrongfully snatching children. I want to put my daughter in college and take her to church, and now she lost in the system at a young age. And I think she got pregnant at a young age. I want this happened to many children all around the city of Philadelphia. I'd like to know if y'all could just take my story, help me, get a, help me get my grievance out, and help me get a pro bono lawyer for all the things that happened to me and my children. I'd like to know if you'll help us open up, get a, somebody to open up our case, get a judge or somebody to help us uh, get the message out to D, about DHS and the judges. That's all I got to say. Thank, Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm also a humanitarian, like I said before. And if anybody could help us get a lawyer, I'll be outside out there at the end of the meeting. I'm going to be here to the very end. Okay. That's all I got to say. Be brief. That's Thank all. you, ma'am. We'll have somebody I'm get really to advocating that. For all the children and youth, and I think they are the future of the world. And I'm going to advocate to the very end. So every child is no longer taken from their children by DHS. I heard this for financial incentives by family court judges at 15 to 1 arch. Okay, ma'am. We'll we have need somebody a pro bono name. attorney. That's something I'm asking them. Might they help us? I'll be outside. My name is Ms. Bennett. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Seth Kulik. I'm a parent of a 10th grader at Academy of Palumbo, and I'm here to speak in support of the Our City, Our Schools budget proposals. At my, at my daughter's school, there are two counselors for nearly 1,000 students. There are, no, there are no social workers. The nurses told me that the students come into her office to use the bathroom because of the state of the other bathrooms, something my daughter confirmed for me, along with the holes in the ceilings and so on. It does not feel good as a parent to read the reports on lead in the drinking water, lead paint, asbestos, and asthma triggers at your daughter's school. Now, less than two months ago, City Council passed a resolution supporting Medicare for All. It quoted the World Health Organization Constitution that, quote, the right to the highest attainable standard of health is a fundamental human right. And City Council quoted Article 25 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that, quote, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. That was City Council. For the students and employees of the Philadelphia schools, part of their standard of living is the time they spend in our schools. Now, City Council may not have control over Medicare for all, but if those words are to mean anything, then you can demand increased funding from the city's 1% for the 2018 city budget. Do we ensure that our students and school employees don't get sick from their buildings, or is it more important to subsidize those who have quite enough already? Yeah! Some of, finally, some of the proposals from our city, our schools are not new, although they have been updated for 2018. And over the years, similar proposals have been put forth, and the School Reform Commission consistently ignored them. And one of the, re well, had, one of the reasons I looked forward to the ending of the SRC was so that after all these years of their hypocritical talk about shared sacrifice, proposals such as those put forward by our city, our schools, could finally receive the consideration that our students and our teachers so deserve. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, I'm Zoe Buckwalter. I'm a proud fourth grade teacher in Strawberry Mansion. <laughs> um, this year we have dealt with over a dozen suicidal children, including a kindergartner, fights daily, students running the halls for hours with no staff available to direct them back to class, several calls for ambulances, city police at the school almost daily, half a dozen teachers walked out and resigned in the middle of the year. We have one school counselor for about 600 students, and she's often asked to cover for classes that don't have a teacher. I told my students I was coming here today. I told them that the mayor and city council are asking regular people, like their parents, to continue to pay taxes, while big businesses, universities, and developers who make millions of dollars pay nothing. I told them that if we implemented the Our City, Our Schools plan, the schools would be given $300 million more million per year. I also told them I would bring some of their written response to, sh to share with you today. Kylan, age nine, wrote, my mother pays taxes and has a lot of kids. She can barely save any money for us. Brianna and Nadir, ages 10, wrote, we need money for clothes, food, rent, our phone bills, and college. Why is it hard for us to pay for these things, but people with millions of dollars don't pay anything to the schools? <laughs> Zaniya, age nine, wrote, we don't even have a playground at our school, and we've been trying to raise the money ourselves for years. The mental and physical harm that occurs on a daily basis at my school is the direct result of systemic oppression against black people, teachers, working class, and poor people that's been occurring for centuries. By not requiring the wealth and resources in our city to be distributed fairly, our mayor and our city councilors are actively allowing poverty, racism, mental illness, and physical danger to occur on a daily basis. My students get painted and treated like criminals when they act out, but let's be honest about who the real criminals are here. Let's consider who has access to resources that could actually transform communities and schools. We need the Our City, Our Schools funding plan to ensure the safety, health, quality of education, and quality of life to all of our city students and teachers. And we need that funding to go not to things that perpetuate the criminalization of black and brown children like police officers and metal detectors, but to school counselors, to nurses, restorative programs, playgrounds, music and art classes, pay teachers more, invest in de-escalation trainings and peer mediation programs. 
There is no excuse for such disgraceful poverty and under-resourced schools in a city where so many corporations, developers, and universities are profiting in millions of dollars every year. We are begging that you no longer choose the side of greed and profits over children's lives, teachers, and public education. Thank you. Thank you. Please proceed. Good evening. My name is Anna Perring. I'm a parent of two disabled children. One attends public school and the other attends preschool. Since 2016, my son has attended McCall Elementary School, a national blue ribbon school at McCall. Families volunteer, donate, and work with teachers and staff to provide what our children need. Now, as an elected parent representative on the School Advisory Council, I've reached out to community partners to help supplement what our school lacks. I've applied for grants, so solicited donations. I've reached out to partners like Sixers Youth Foundation to see if we can bring NBA Math Hoops, a free after-school activity, to our school because our students' math scores have declined. But a basic challenge is the lack of funding to even keep our building open after 3 p.m. As a result, there are limited after-school activities, and most of our after-school activities require almost $100 per student for several weeks of programming, leaving a majority of our low-income students behind in terms of after-school and summer programming. On Monday, as a part of Teacher Appreciation Week, I shared my son's teacher's GoFundMe for new desks and chairs. She's been teaching at McCall for 23 years. She used her first paycheck to buy our photocopier. She also picked the desks and the chairs from the trash 23 years ago. So now she has a GoFundMe. We're trying to raise $4,500 so the students can finally have even desks and chairs. City Council has the, an intergovernmental cooperative agreement with the school district to provide transparency and fiscal responsibility. It's important that the school district be held accountable also for the way that it spends money. In particular, last July, the School Reform Commission approved a $10 million contract to Catapult Learning, a vendor with no track record in special education, to educate 100 learning disabled students, even though teachers and families were asking for that same money to be invested in their neighborhood schools. Research shows students are educated that are educated in more inclusive environments have better outcomes in health, education, and community living. During that vote, the School Reform Commission approved over $8 million to go to private law firms. While there is no rationale attached to the request, special ed families know those private law firms are used to bully us and drive us to the suburbs. We can do better. The school district should reinvest in hiring ombudsmen, people who can work with schools and families to resolve civil rights complaints. It would save our taxpayers dollars, and it would help us invest in our schools wisely. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Stanley Shapiro, Joseph Hohenstein, Aileen Callahan, or Eileen Callahan. Okay. Mindy Isser. Good evening. Good evening, President Clark and council members. I uh, especially want to say hello to my uh, inestimable councilwoman, Maria Quinones Sanchez. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present my testimony today. My name is Joseph Hohenstein. I'm a resident of the city and a candidate for public office. My family goes back five generations in Philadelphia. I went to Frankfurt High School. My wife and I raised our daughters here, and then we sent them to Philly's public schools. I'm running to be the state representative in this 177th district, which covers the Lower Northeast and the River Wards. So can we limit it to political? Yes. Because this is not a format for that. No, no, this is, this is directed straight to the, the I want to talk to so the I tax to, issues. I have, yeah. to have to have a public hearing next week to give your opponent time to come in here. Yeah. Sorry, so this, talk about the issue. 
Yeah. I know. Thank um, you. The folks at Our Cities, Our Schools ha and uh, the, the Philly Power Research Collective have put together a really solid plan about how we can raise money and lighten the load on working families. And I fully support that plan. And I'm calling on City Council to adopt it and incorporate it into the ci this city's budget. And as I've been out knocking on doors, I want to share some stories about why I feel that way. Um, the folks in my district, they, they, um, they send me one message. They say, look, the, the working class is burdened with the weight of the city's taxes. Um, the most recent thing I've seen is rage, literal rage coming from people's eyes as they talk to me about the property tax hikes that they're looking at. I've got generational homeowners who, they might have the homestead credit, but that's not enough when they're looking at those assessments going up and those tax bills going up. Um, folks in my district also don't understand why big corporations, and I include the University of Pennsylvania in that, why those big corporations are getting out of paying, of paying their fair share. Um, one of the, uh, give you a couple of stories. I've got a senior in Bridesburg. She can't afford to stay in the home that her family has owned for generations. She fears displacement. I've got a single mother in Mayfair. She's forced to send her 13-year-old son to live with his grandparents in the Poconos just because the local school is neither safe nor sound. She's fearing violence. We've got parents throughout the district who cross their fingers hoping to win the beggar's lottery that comes with charter school selections. Now those parents fear ignorance. Now in many cases they're not getting the quality that they're promised, but that's a different issue for a different day. Again, Right now, we've got to get away from this culture of fear, mm -hmm. and I'm calling on city council, look at this plan that our city, our schools, and the, and the Philly Power Research Collective have put together. Put that into the budget. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, sir. Afternoon, council. My name is Elaine Callahan. I'm a single mother of the four-year-old that's been running around all day. Um, I'm an educator in South Philadelphia. I'm a member of Reclaim, and I'm here in support of the Our City, Our Schools Fair funding proposal. I grew up in the River Wards, um, and when I turned 20 years old, I was not able to afford to purchase the home that my mother raised me in, that she was raised in. I now live in West Philadelphia, and my property value just quadrupled. I'm a renter, but I have no security to make sure that I'm going to be able to continue to live here. As 24, I have lived in eight different homes through my life. My son is four. He has lived in four different homes. We have been at risk of displacement every single year. The property tax directly affects renters. It hurts tenants. A property tax increase will effectively displace my son and I from our home. The only way in order for my schools and the, the schools that I teach in and the schools that my son attends to have the type of funding where I don't have to put forward $300 a month just to make sure that my students have the supplies that they need and that my son is able to have any sort of security is if we have the one percenters in our community pay their fair share. They are a direct reason for this ballooning in our property values. They are the reason why I continually get displaced. The only way for us to have the security is for them to pay up. University of Pennsylvania has a bigger operating budget than the entire city of Philadelphia. They generate $17.6 billion in revenue a year. Why are they considered a nonprofit? Why do, not they, why do they not pay pilots? They are the only, sorry, they are the only Ivy League college in the nation that doesn't pay pilots. They need to pay their fair share for our schools. I have fought way too hard to have what semblance of security I have, and I will fight that much harder to make sure that we have an opportunity for our children to get the type of funding that they've always deserved. This is what the Our City, Our Schools Fair funding proposal brings us. Without this, our schools are only going to experience the massive disparity that we have. We have lead poisoning issues in Northeast Philadelphia. We have lead lead in the soil in Fishtown. 
there have been plumes of lead dust because people aren't following the regulations that they need to, going over daycares. It's a slap in the face of the working class. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, Council President Clark and members of Council. My name is Stanley Shapiro, and I am Vice Chair of Philly Neighborhood Networks, a member of Our City, Our Schools. Some of you still remember when I was a member of Council's legal staff in the latter two decades of the last century, a while ago. Toward the end of that time, Council approved a deal to fund the Eagles and Phillies' new stadium. I remember well how appalled I was about that deal the major effect of which was to funnel $300 million into the pockets of fabulously wealthy team owners. Of course, the city didn't have $300 million to hand over, so it had to borrow the, borrow the money. It did so by selling bonds that cost us another $700 million in interest. And that money also mostly went into the pockets of fabulously wealthy people. That stadium deal speaks to the fundamental economic political philosophy that has governed this city for decades. Basically, it amounts to this. We can do nothing of any major value in this city without throwing our money at rich people. That's the philosophy underlying the city's wildly generous tax abatement policy. It's why we've been continuously pairing business taxes since 1996. It's why instead of raising the use and occupancy tax, so that the barons of commercial real estate pay their fair share, the mayor wants tens of thousands of row house owners and renters to pay more real estate tax through rate and assessment hikes. It's why rich institutions like Jefferson and Penn pay no real estate tax, assessment and rate hikes be damned. OCOS rejects this philosophy in the mayor's plan. While we have coddled the rich for low these many years, the main distinction Philly has achieved is to become the very poorest of the nation's big cities. The cycle of poverty is entrenched for many of our children at birth, locked into crumbling neighborhoods by redlining and denied a basic education for lack of the funds that we've sent off to the rich. Our kids are getting actively poisoned in our literally crumbling schools. And the main answer we've had for the social malaise caused by our feed the rich policies is the spare no dollar program that puts its victims in jail. It's time to turn this philosophy on its ear and ask the well-off to rescue our schools in the manner laid out by OCOS. And by the way, if you create the Philly Public Bank, as OCOS calls for, the next time the city or the school district decides it needs to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in interest on a borrowing, it will cycle those funds right back into its own coffers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, folks. Please adopt this OCOS platform. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Mindy Isser, Kate Cairns, Katie Kella. Thank you very much. My name is Kate Cairns, and I'm here with many supporters today of the Our City, Our Schools Coalition to advocate for their proposal for equitable school funding. I want to speak today from two roles. The first is as a resident of Philadelphia. I love Philly, but I have to say I'm ashamed and angry to live in a city that fails to provide our schools with the resources children need to learn and thrive. And as a resident of West Philadelphia, I'm particularly appalled that the University of Pennsylvania, a wealthy Ivy League institution, doesn't contribute to funding our public schools. This flies in the face of the university's supposed commitment to educational values. If Penn wants to maintain its image as an institution of learning, it needs to put its money where its mouth is and give back to the community it's a part of. So I, I strongly support OCOS's call for payments in lieu of taxes. I'm also here today to speak as a scholar whose research and teaching focus on issues of child well-being and educational inequality. 
Recently, in one of my courses, we discussed the environmental health risks that disproportionately harm children in marginalized groups, including low-income communities and communities of color. I was horrified earlier this week to read of the environmental hazards facing children here in Philadelphia's schools, from toxic paint to toxic lead paint to mold spores and asbestos fibers. This is an urgent public health crisis with potentially devastating consequences, and it's one that needs to be seen as clearly linked to the chronic underfunding of Philadelphia's schools. I think, I think we often imagine schools to be the great equalizer within society, but research actually consistently shows that schooling can exacerbate inequalities when disparities in resources aren't addressed. So I want to call on you today as city councilors who are concerned about the well-being of young people in your city to redress this injustice, injustice by forcing developers and mega nonprofits like Penn to pay their fair share. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to keep it quick because we've heard this message before. Um, my name is Katie Kella. I'm a Philadelphia public school teacher and a member of the Caucus of Working Educators. And um, my request is simple. As my elected officials and on behalf of all Philadelphia public school children, I request that you fund our schools. Um, we're broke. That narrative is old and tired and it's also inaccurate. We're not broke. There's several measures that the city can take to fund Philadelphia public schools. So, end the 10-year tax abatement. Fairly tax Comcast, the PPA, Penn, Drexel, everyone else, and stop the reductions in the big business tax and increase taxes on corporate landlords. Like I've said, you've heard it before, but it seems like we need to say it again and again until the message gets home. Not only do Philly public schools need fair funding to adequately educate all of our students, but we also need this funding to keep our buildings healthy. As a teacher, I work in a building that has flaking lead dust, asbestos, mice, roaches, trash. It's disgusting. It's awful. And nobody should have to work or send their child to school in conditions like this. So. It's imperative that these issues are addressed because it's life or death. Further, the funding should not take away from our children's education. So I applaud you for your leadership, and we all know that we need more than just closing the budget deficit. We need to actually create the schools that our children deserve. So this is your opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brie Tessmore. Hi. Um, oh, is it my? Oh, can I? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Cool. Thank you so much. This, this, this. Um, my name is Mindy Iser. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the uh, members of City Council who are here tonight, and a special shout out to the ones who are actually listening and not on their phones or reading the newspaper. Um, um, I'm a homeowner here. I bought my house in the Point Breeze section of South Philly a little over five years ago, and I have a tax abatement. My sister, who lives with me, is a public school teacher here. Every day when she comes home from work demoralized, I hear firsthand about how, how our schools suffer. Although her school has been designated a community school, it still lacks basic necessities, including necessary staff like ESOL teachers and counselors. Most of her students have already been through an immense amount of trauma in their 12 years of life. And although she does the best she can, my sister is a trained teacher, not a therapist. Many of her students have learning disabilities and behavioral problems, and there's just not enough staff on site to support them. Relatedly, her school was just found to have the second highest concentration of lead in their drinking fountains. One of her students is currently in the ICU at CHOP for asthma-related complications, perhaps caused by the conditions at her school. I guess we'll never know for sure if her students' physical and emotional problems are caused by lead and other environmental issues or by being forced to bear the brunt of racism at po and poverty at such a young age. The vast majority of my sister's students are children of color, just like all of the students in our district. The majority of tax abatements are in 10 neighborhoods adjacent to Center City, including Graduate Hospital and Point Breeze. The majority of people benefiting from tax abatements, outside of wealthy developers, of course, are white, like me. 
The abatement is given to those who buy new or renovated properties, which means that it's given to people who can qualify for mortgages. City Council is well aware that in our city, black people are almost three times as likely to be denied a conventional mortgage. In 2015 and 16, white applicants received 10 times as many conventional mortgage loans as black applicants. This means that, almost certainly, white people also received 10 times as many abatements. I'm grateful that you all are brainstorming how to fight back against racist lending, but you're also letting white people, myself included, yeah. off the hook from paying property taxes for 10 years. I'm oh. almost done, thank you. And no, where would that me, money me, be going me, if you all did ask everyone to pay their fair share? Ma'am, ask you to wrap it up, please. I'm, I'm almost done. Thank you. All right, we, the we money we would be the going attitude. to fund right. a school district where 85% of students are children of color. You are literally helping white people continue to build wealth while denying necessary resources to black and brown families. You are starving. I'm almost done. Please don't touch me. You are starving our schools, harming our students, and allowing teachers to burn out. The abatement has become nothing more than a better way to line the pockets of developers and the predominantly white and financially stable who can afford to buy these new and renovated homes. There is no need to turn our money off. Ending the abatement would simply be asking everyone to pay their fair share. I am here tonight begging to pay my fair share. Peter Coyle, Tanya Ba, Ron Whitehorn, Please proceed. Good evening. My name is Tanya Ba. I'm an, I'm an activist that was denied access to the mayor's appointed school board. So a journalist asked me if I thought it was time for change in Philadelphia, time for political change considering this city has been democratically run for decades. I corrected him. This city has not been run by Democrats. This city has been run by the 1%. 1% allows 10-year tax abatement. 1% does not consider a funding plan that makes sense for the working class. 1% criminalizes poverty and ignores demands from the city controller to do a full audit on an Eli Broad Academy-run superintendent that serves alongside of an NFSRC that approved contracts that further dismantle public education. My name is Tanya Bach and I am a member of Neighborhood Networks and Apps and Caucus of Working Educators and our city, our schools. A feasibility study on a public bank makes sense. A public bank would eliminate fees to Wall Street. It's in the our city, our schools funding plan. There are more like me. We have an army and we demand that true representation for the working class, for the parents, for the taxpayers, for students, for seniors, and voters, and people of color, returning citizens, and folks on fixed incomes. We demand that they get the full representation, and not by the 1%, but by those that were elected in here. In 1983, I graduated from Simon Gratz. Years later, I see schools like my alma mater privatized. I listen to false narratives reported and printed about our educators, about our students, about parents, about the educational system that is given the lowest priority in Philadelphia. And I know this to be false. I show up for the tears. I show up for the kids that cut themselves, that commit suicide when life seems too much. And I know that the racist classes curriculum that's paid for by my tax dollars does little to share the contributions of folks that look like me. Right. I need you. You're the leadership, right? You need to consider a public bank. You need to consider the Our City, Our Schools funding plan. You were elected to represent us. 
people that look like me and like him and like him. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I need to know that you're going to do that. Under, under, under a new city control of Rebecca Reinhardt, it is imperative that an audit of a budget of $3 billion gets done for our school district. Okay. You got Dr. Hyden here. The mayor can get rid of him whenever he's ready. Whenever he's ready. I need you to lead. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you you want to lead? Every day. Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. Please proceed. Um, hi, my name is uh, Peter Coyle. Um, I'm an art teacher at West Philadelphia High School. Um, and um, there's a lot of talk about how we don't have enough teachers. And what people tend to imagine is overcrowded classrooms. Um, but it's, it's much more than that. Um, because we don't have enough teachers at my school, um, instead of having four electives, taught by four different teachers, we have two electives taught by two teachers. So what that means is I teach ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders all in the same class like it's a one-room schoolhouse, regardless of their abilities. Um, the, the way I have to teach because of this setup, I cannot build student skills year after year. I'm basically forced into teaching an art appreciation class that is for everyone. Students don't choose to take my class. They're just placed there because they have to go somewhere. So they don't even, I have students that don't even want to learn about art and they're frustrated. And then I have students that want to go beyond and they're held back. Um, it's, it's not only that they're, they're forced to take the elective, but because they only need two credits, some of them take it once, twice, three times, four times. And when I have a senior who's taken my class four times and already has their two credits, and they, they know that they can, they can fail my class and still graduate, it's very, very difficult to motivate those students. And I don't, I don't even blame them for being frustrated. So. I just wanted you guys to understand that not having enough teachers is not just about class size. It's Thank about you. how a teacher can actually operate. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening, members of council. My name is Ron Whitehorn. I'm a retired teacher. I live in the Longcrest neighborhood in the Northeast. I'm on the Franklin Elementary Pardon me? Oh, okay, thank you. I'm, a, I'm on the Franklin Elementary School Advisory Council and volunteer there two days a week. I'm a member of 215 People's Alliance and the Our Cities, Our Schools Coalition. How, how, how a society cares for its young is one measure of its moral quality. And by that standard, we should be very concerned about where our city, state, and nation are going. I'm sure you all read the Inquirer the other day. The revelations in that article about the toxic environment in our school buildings is nothing new to those of us who have worked in these buildings. But it's very important that these problems are now getting broader exposure. It places in sharp relief the choices before city council this budget season. There would seem to be a clear imperative to make fixing these conditions a high priority. Yes, it will cost money, but a practical plan has been advanced by the Healthy Schools Initiative, a coalition led by the PFT, that would provide short-term relief and a long-term fix. The question is, does City Council have the political will to raise revenue in an equitable way or will it continue to do the bidding of big business? Good question. Go, 
We can't continue cutting taxes on business and subsidizing condo developers and rich people and still fix our schools. We can't ask working class taxpayers to pay more while corporations and mega nonprofits feed at the public trough. Let's get rid of the 10-year tax abatement and use the savings to improve our schools, beginning with fixing the environmental problems. Maybe then more of the recipients of those abatements might actually stay in our city when their children reach school age. Let's call on the University of Pennsylvania, which has an endowment larger than the GNP of dozens of countries and is the biggest landowner of the city to pay pilots. Let's think about creating a public bank so that the capital programs like new school construction and large-scale rehabilitation of those sick buildings benefits the city and not Wall Street. Our country and our city have spawned movements for economic and racial justice. It's time to listen to them. Thank you. We're tired of the 1% getting richer while the rest of us scurry to get crumbs from their table. Thank you, thank you, sir. Please. We're tired of seeing people of color subjected to discriminatory, life-threatening conditions, whether from police violence or toxic schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Antoine Little, Philip Gentry, Barbara. Vitarelli, Vitarello. <clears throat> Jonathan Lebovic. Pam Gibson, Brad Wilson, are we waiting on me or are y'all waiting on? Good to go? Yeah, please. Good evening, everybody. Evening. My name is Antoine, excuse me, I am a little sick, so no I apologize. Problem. My name is Antoine Little. I'm the chair of our city, our schools coalition. I'm on the, I am on the steering committee of 215 People's Alliance. I'm also a parent of four public school children, to one of whom graduates this year. I reside in North Philly. Today, I would like to briefly speak to you about the changes I've seen over the years in North Philadelphia from the closures of not one, not two, not three, not four, but five public schools in a two to three mile radius. We're talking about, we're talking about the potential closure of Strawberry Mansion, Hill, Walton, Whittier, Simon Gratz and Gillespie, which are now in the hands of Mastery Charter, all in the black community. Another year we're being told that there's another budget deficit as, we, as if we need to hear another more depressing news that will impact the way educators educate our children. If there's a shortfall, there's a responsibility of all parties involved to figure out a way to fix the problem. In North Philly alone, you have a university that doesn't pay its fair share, and they need to. That's Temple University. Temple University and other universities like that that don't pay, that don't pay to the schools should pay pilots. When you look around the Temple University area, development is booming with a housing or apartment going up and the property owners gets a 10-year tax abatement. That's why we're asking for an end of the program. The people that should be benefiting from the program are not benefiting, so it needs to end. Again, in North Philly, you have, a big corporate land you have big corporate landlords that needs to begin to pay a use and occupancy tax to help fund our school. Gentrification has torn through North Philadelphia and the process has only gotten bigger. Stop putting the burden on the citizens of Philadelphia, 
put it on the 1% of the city who doesn't pay their fair share. I'm from North Philadelphia. I'm from the 2700 block of North 24th Street, and I vote. Thank you for your testimony. All right, it's three minutes, right? Three minutes. All right, happy Teacher Appreciation Week, everybody. Uh, and, and Nurses Appreciation Week, too. Uh, when I first decided to become a teacher... Excuse, excuse, did you say your name? Just oh, say, I'm Jonathan. State your name for the Jonathan record. Leibovic. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers and the Caucus okay. of Working Thank Educators. You. And when I first decided to become a teacher, I think my dad was a little bit disappointed. Uh, he's a doctor, and he wanted me to go to medical school as well. But his dad, that's my grandfather, he said, that's wonderful because education is the most important thing in life. They can take everything from you, but they can't take your education. And he's a Holocaust survivor, so I think that he would know. <laughs> in my first year as a teacher, I met a kid, we'll call him Michael... Michael was a sweet kid, he's a good older brother, he's a very talented artist, but he did not excel in math, which is my subject. Uh, he counted on his fingers to add two plus two, and this is in eighth grade. And furthermore, uh, Michael had a violent temper that would flare up violently and unpredictably. He would fall asleep in class. And it all made sense when I learned that Michael had lead poisoning as a small child. That explained all of his symptoms perfectly. And this was also just around the time that the news was breaking about the water in Flint, Michigan. So I decided our next science project would be to test our water quality at the school. I applied for some grants, and my eighth graders collected uh, samples from all the sinks and the water fountains in our school. Thankfully, we did not find any lead, but we did find high levels of iron, copper, nitrates, and coliform bacteria. And since then, every year, my eighth graders test the water, and every year we find <coughs> the same problems. Now, it's no secret that our schools need money, and it's also no secret that UPenn and Comcast, IBX, Drexel, and others have lots of money. I know that city council is aware of these facts, and I know that you're not stupid or ignorant, so if you choose not to fund our schools, that really leaves only a couple of possible explanations. Either you're corrupt and completely in the pockets of these corporations and supposed nonprofits, or maybe you know something that we don't, and I would love to know what that is. Uh, I think I have a minute left, so if people want to chant a little bit of fund our schools, that's fine with me. And <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you very much for the time. Uh, and now I've got to get to Chipotle because they have buy one get one free uh, burritos for teachers this week. Okay, thank you. So. All right, hello everybody. I'm Bradford Wilson. I live in North Philly. Daryl, now you finally can hear me out. Everybody. Four times last year, I ride bike around the city to get around, and I'll say it straight, I still have my swing varsity that my dad bought me when I was in high school. I'm very happy to still ride a bike. 39-year-old swing, how many can do that? But here's what's pissing me off, Riley. And Daryl, the rest of y'all really need to do something about this. Twice, I've been hit by a taxi, a Jamaican guy, on South Street. They come up behind me, knock me over. I go eight, I don't like being hit by cars. Daryl, I'm too old for that, all right? The next thing, I've been hit three times on Broad Street. Last year, hit twice, and because of one of the incidents, eight, August 31st, I've been in medical treatment for eight months now, all right? And we need better safety security on Broad Street. South Street needs it, Broad Street needs it. And I feel that one thing I found, I was hit Broad in Jefferson, Broad in Cumberland, each time. The second time I was hit in Broad Street last year, was October 30, no, October 26, when you kicked me out again, all right? I wanted to talk because I was really hot about it. But the thing is, the driver was a young black kid, and it was a hit and run. I called the cops to make a report. Daryl, we need to do something about the bike safety. I witnessed a Philly cop on Walnut Street around 16th get hit, and then the asshole who hit him came backwards and ran over his bike again, all right? This is really get out of control. The positive part, I tell you, last night, Lester Holt on the news did a story in Portland, Oregon, about Portland's got the best bicycle safety lanes. They're green out in, in the middle of the streets, and they got the best safety records for bicycle riders out there, all right? We need better bicycle rules. I came up with some ideas, plus not to mention the girl who got hit, 27-year-old girl got hit and killed by a trash truck owned by Philadelphia last year. That's pathetic. How does a trash truck hit a girl when you're doing your route and your trash truck only moves three miles an hour? How do you kill someone? You're not paying attention, all right? That driver should be nailed for, what's that called? Um, manslaughter. 
Yeah, manslaughter is what that's called, all right? I hope the guy goes to prison for it. We need better rules on drivers. The one thing I came up with, the state of Delaware does defensive driving courses, all right? That does improve driving. How come the state of Pennsylvania, even though it doesn't have defensive driving courses? Daryl, be a cool dude. Show how cool you can be. Get us defensive driving course to improve driving. I see you're agreeing. Good man. I agree that I'm a cool dude. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Be cool and get, get this done. I'm too old to get hit. Right. Don't make me Thank come you. back again, Daryl. All right. Thank you. All right? Cool. Thank you for your testimony. Aura Townsend, Claire Scott, Orlando Costa. Hi, my name is Claire Scott. I'm representing 2101 uh, Co-op. And my neighbors testified earlier this evening, and I realized that the seniors were represented, but I, as an AARP member, close to retirement by 10 years, did not have a chance to speak for the 25% of our building that's still there working and originally planned on being there the same way as my other neighbors. We had no intentions of moving or leaving. As financially, anybody will know that you don't go into a mortgage at the age of 55. So the home that I selected when I was 43 was the home I intended to live for the rest of my life. I started here in Philadelphia at the age of 25, and by the time I was 29, I was homeless. I then, after three years of being knocked around and going from apartment to apartment, found a place called the Lucy Eaton Smith Residency. This was run by the Dominican Sisters. It is now called Kate's Place. And I lived for three years in emergency housing. In those three years, I managed to save up enough funds to buy my apartment. I am now looking at the fact that with a 70% increase, I am going to be outplaced in at least five years. So at my retirement age, I am looking at being homeless again. I've saved my money. I've done everything that's smart to make sure that I can be a productive citizen, pay my taxes, and make sure that there's enough for me at the end of my lifetime to retire and not work till I'm 75. I do have one thing to say for everybody that's been here, and I was really interested in the um, response from the teachers. It amazed me that every single teacher here from their heart is speaking for what their students need. Not one of them asked for a raise. They're just asking for the basics of being able to educate. For the students, and I speak from my heart here from a, from a person who barely got out of high school. I made a three-point average because I took mime class. You, no one gives you an education. You earn it. You earn it with respect for yourself and for others. And you earn it with your discipline and your willingness to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hello, um, my name is Orlando Acosta. Um, actually, I didn't even know this was going on today. Actually, I didn't even know this was going on today. 
I'm glad I walked in on this. Um, basically, um, uh, I've been coming here for years and years and years to talk about schools, what we need to do with funding on housing, different things like that. This is supposed to be the city of your brotherly love. Where's the love? Where's the love for anybody? So nobody in our minority communities basically is getting no love in regards to our schools. I mean, think about it. The biblical times, what do they think the Bible and the, and the Lord would say about all of this at this given moment in time? Here we elect people to do jobs that, that are hard to do. But when you know that something is not right, you don't keep people in business that make millions of dollars that don't contribute back to our communities. So if they don't contribute back to our communities, why do we keep funding them? Why do we keep giving them millions of dollars to do development? different things, gentrification. Why do we keep doing it? But then every time election time come, we want everybody to elect them. And I'm telling everybody, if you don't like what's going on, stop electing people that's not doing what you want them to do. So we can't get mad if somebody's not doing something right, but when that, that election time come, that means don't pull a lever. Don't put them in the seat. I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, and if, I'm a, if I was elected, and I know all of this mess that's going on, and I know if heart of hearts, I know they're taking my community and my area away, I couldn't sleep right. I couldn't go to bed right. I couldn't even function correct. And I, I look at all of y'all, and I'm here every day and all the time. And y'all know that some of these people that's in this city is not doing right. Y'all already know this. So why are y'all doing it? Not everybody, but the ones that's letting all this development going on, but they're not contributing to our schools, and they're robbing our schools. Our children are getting sick every single day. Parents is poor. They don't have money to take them to the hospital. Different things like that. And I'm only saying that because at the end of the day, people look towards y'all to do the job. Okay? That's all I'm saying. We got to work together. If this is seriously a city of brotherly love, we got to start showing the communities the love. And it's just that simple, Daryl. And it's not just you, everybody. You know what I mean? Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pastor Luisa Baerga. I think everyone deserves to say good afternoon to each other. Good afternoon. Yes, because it seems like we're having a battle here. And we all should be united. And being a pastor, that's my job, to make sure that everybody's united. We are born leaders. We have a leader in the front that's trying to listen, and we have born leaders in the back that are trying to implement something that's very important, to be in unity, to unify what's important to our future children and to our families and to our house. What is our house? 
our city. I've heard everything here. I've heard people raising their voices about the schools and their funds. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, and I know there's about two minutes here in the bell will ring, but Ecclesiastes chapter three tells me there's a time for everything. And in these two minutes, I'm gonna tell you that God is of love, and he's not of fighting. There's a way to make peace about this. And the peace about this is to come to the conclusion that we cannot be homeless. Our children, education is first. Our families need to be set free. There's too many of us fighting over what is needed. Why do I say this? I'm a SAC ambassador. I just don't wear a pastor's hat. I'm a mother with a child with Down syndrome, so I advocate for the children with special needs as well. I also come out to the school district and the police district. I'm also a back captain, and I fight for the community. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is you're here fighting for the funds and you're fighting each other, but the plan has to come to unity. If the funds is needed by the rich, the rich should be sharing with the poor because the poor shouldn't be getting poor and the rich shouldn't be getting richer. Everybody should be coming together as one. <clears throat> At least that's what the Bible tells me so. And if anybody here has learned anything in that manual, they should understand this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. That concludes our witness list for today's, this evening's public testimony. Thank you all very much for a spirited debate. Um, we look forward to uh, moving ahead on our budget process. Thank you again for coming in. We really appreciate it. This committee will stand in recess until Wednesday, May 9th, 2018 at 10 a.m., at which time we will reconvene in room 400 City Hall. Thank you all very much.